having listened to the second accused representing herself and the fourth accused, a company Fibers Nigeria Limited, and having listened to the submission of Chief Uchi, SAH, their counsel, and having also considered the facts as represented by Mr. Jacobs for the prosecution. I am satisfied that the second and fourth accused persons do intend to plead guilty to the charges against them, as contained in the amended information. And accordingly, I hereby pronounce as follows. Welcome back to 23419, a true crime podcast about advanced fee fraud, popularly known as 419 in Nigeria. Over the next few weeks, we will continue to tell the full story of the biggest fraud case committed in Nigerian history and the rise of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC. This is a work of creative nonfiction. While the story is inspired by actual persons and events, certain characters, characterizations, incidents, locations, and dialogue were fictionalized or invented for purposes of dramatization. The events depicted took place between 1995 and 2005. My name is Choma, and this is 23419. Me. Who, who are these fools? How dare you block my car like that? Do you know who I am? Please tell Ike Chuku and Ajemba. Oh, 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 Imakwa, you know who I am. So you know whose car is this, eh? Imakwa, you know who I am. When Christian Ikechuku and Ajemba stepped out in style on Sunday, the 4th of October, 1998, he couldn't have known that it would be the last time he would see his family. He left behind his widow, Amaka and Ajemba, and four children, with the last just being a few months old. Amaka and Ajemba met Christian in her teens. It was a friendship that led to marriage. She was excited. Her dream was to get married to a man who not only loved her, but would go the extra mile to make his family comfortable. Christian was hardworking, and she came from humble beginnings. So she became a housewife and went on to have four beautiful children. And while managing the home, her husband did well in business. Amaka is fair-skinned and six feet tall, sporting a low cut. Seated in her sprawling mansion in Enugu, Amaka and Ajemba tells us her ordeal. Christian Ike Chukwane Jemba was my soulmate. And from the time we met, I knew it. He promised to take care of me and give me everything I wanted. My husband was a hardworking man. There was no one like him. With an array of interests across different sectors, oil, power, and the tobacco business, he quickly grew in wealth and popularity that it earned him a chieftaincy title in his hometown. Amaka had just turned 30 when Christian died and had to bury her husband according to Igbo traditional rites. After the mourning period had passed, she took over her husband's estate. Mr. Ritchie, now that Sakaguchi has been convicted, how do you intend to catch the other fraudsters who fleeced bank on arrestee of over $242 million? We have an arrest warrant for these criminals. We know the ringleader is a Nigerian man named Emmanuel Nwade, and his co-conspirators are a couple, Christian Anajemba 
who is late now, and his wife, Amaka Onajemba. By tracking the fund transfers through Hong Kong, London, and Switzerland, William Ritchie uncovered who Nelson Sakaguchi was sending the bulk of the funds to. He hired a lawyer in Geneva called Pierre Shefali to help track it down. They managed to get a freezing order for $5 million, and in addition, the information on who owned the account and how it was opened. As a result, they traced the owners to Nigeria. I thought the Swiss banking system was secretive, so I asked Mr. Babajide Ogundikwe about this. He was on William Rich's team and represented Banco Norieste's interest in Nigeria. Yes, um, it's a myth. Swiss banking secrecy is a myth when you are dealing with criminal conduct. If a crime is alleged to have been committed, the Swiss prosecutors have the ability to, one, freeze the bank account and demand and obtain information about who the beneficial holders of the bank accounts are on a criminal complaint. And this is what happened. A criminal complaint was made. It was an allegation was made that the money laundering had occurred because the money was stolen and then it was laundered through Switzerland. And on that complaint, the prosecutor was able to get, was, was able to order the freezing of the account and order the, all the banking information to be delivered to him. The, the, um, the complainants in Switzerland are entitled in a, civil claim, in, a, in a civil case to join in the action as a civil party. And in doing so, they have, the civil party has access to all the documentation that the prosecutor has access to. And it was by using that, those tools, criminal, criminal complaint in Switzerland, that the Bank on Arrest team was able to obtain information about who opened the account and where the money had gone. And they conducted um, a tracing exercise and were able to trace the monies to all sorts of places. This led the investigation to the Anajembad in 2002. According to Amaka, this wasn't the first time she heard these allegations. In 2000, a man named Dr. Uke, the same name that was used in a reference in the initial fax sent to Sakaguchi, approached her to ask for his share in a deal herself and her husband were involved in. Amaka told him off, stating she didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> I have never met this Dr. Uke before. So when he met me to demand payment for a business deal I didn't know about, I was shocked. I was a successful woman, especially because I was managing all my husband's businesses. I just thought he was, you know, one of those men who wanted to take advantage because I was a widow. In 2003, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, was inaugurated by President Lusago Obasanjo. It was in response to pressure from the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering, which named Nigeria as one of the 23 countries non-cooperative in the international community's efforts to fight money laundering. The chairman of the EFCC was Nuhu Ribadu. Ribadu studied law at Amadu Bello University in Zaria, Kaduna State from 1980 until 1983. He was called to bar in 1984 and earned a Master of Law degree from the same university. He served in the force and was the Assistant Inspector General of Police before this appointment. As the inaugural chairman of the EFCC, the first case on my table was the fraud uh, committed by three Nigerians against a bank in Brazil called Banco Norest. Uh, the case had been investigated by the Interpol, but eventually it came to us because they didn't have any jurisdiction in Nigeria. I wasn't part of any fraud. I didn't even know this man, Nelson Saka, Sakaguchi, they were talking about. How they wrote, I am my late husband, bless his soul, and this was shocking. I was not just scared for myself, 
I was also scared for my children. This is Nigeria and anything can happen. My husband was murdered and yet nothing has been done about it till today. From December 1997 to February 1998, before Christian Alajimba was murdered, the sum of $3,997,500 was transferred to Vanua Foundation. Amaka Anajimba was the sole beneficiary. This and other transactions made to the companies DaxPN, Primo, Finbaz, owned by the Anajimbas, contradicted Amaka's claims. We weren't just going to go about accusing random citizens of their involvement in fraud. We, we had done our own investigations. And one thing about money, you see, was no matter how much you hide it, when one searches properly, and I mean it, when one searches properly, you can trace where it came from. A warrant was gotten for her arrest, but by the time the EFCC got to her home, Amaka was nowhere to be found. She moved her children to the care of relatives, and they claimed to be ignorant of her whereabouts. What was shocking to the EFCC officials was that every item in her house was also cleared out. Her cars, furniture, all gone. Then they realized they had underestimated her. Like I said, I was being misunderstood. I knew that there were charges against me, and I had to consult with the people who knew the law better than I did. I wasn't running. I was just trying to get my bearings together. Remember, I was a young widow. My children were stressed out because of all the news flying around. In fact, I thought this was the trappings of evil people because in Nigeria, things are different for women who took over their husband's properties. Amaka was lying low in a residential area in Ilupeju, Lagos, having fled Enugu. She was acting as a caretaker to two senior citizens. The EFCC had it out for me and my late husband. Now that my husband was dead, instead of them to look for the people who were responsible, they blamed me. I don't even know if Emmanuel Wude was involved, but they kept painting both of us as criminals in the press. Yes, I was in Ilupeju. But I was in a friend's house trying to get advice from my lawyers and family. She was tired of hiding out. The life of a fugitive wasn't for her, and she couldn't remain separated from her children. I wanted to do the right thing. I just wanted it all to end. And if meeting with Ribadu, the head of EFCC, was what I needed to do to get this over with, I was ready to do it. <laughs> Every human being that you see, they will take the liberties when, when they can. That is for sure. Because you see, Mrs. Anna Jamba tried through her lawyers with bribery. Not once, not twice, but three times. The EFCC accused Amaka Anna Jamba of bribery. They acknowledged that corruption was rife in the judicial system. After all, how did she know about the warrants? Amaka's first target was the officer in charge of the investigation. Ibrahim Lamodi. She offered him $10,000 and he accepted. I reached out to Mr. Lamodi. When her lawyer reached out to me, I thought they wanted to give me information in return for reduced sentence. He brought $10,000 in cash. I was stunned. $10,000 was and still a lot of money. Any man could be tempted. But Amaka denied the allegation. She tells a different story. My lawyers had been dealing with the officers in charge of the investigation, and they asked him to tell me to settle them. They were the ones who asked for the bribe, and I said no. But these people, hmm, these people made life difficult for me. So I gave in. One of the things I remember them telling me was that it should be classified as a gift and not a bribe. She waited a while to see if there was going to be any repercussions for her actions. And when there wasn't any, she sent her lawyer to another officer, Umar Sander, with a million naira. A 
after the exchange between I and Lamode, there was no chatter and it seemed like it was over. But I knew the case wasn't dead. My gut feeling told me they would be back. My lawyers agreed with me and that was when I took a huge decision. The smear campaign on I and my late husband needed to end. A month later, Amaka Anajemba made her way to the EFCC chairman's office. She explained to Ribadu that she had no idea what was going on as she was a housewife. She only inherited her husband's businesses after he died. She apologized for causing him any unnecessary trouble. At the end of that meeting, she told him she wanted to show appreciation for his understanding by giving him a gift. <laughs> when the Ghana Must Go bags arrived in my office, Extremely shocking. I was 30 million naira. Uh, I have been a police officer for, for a while, for, for a period of time. So I have seen a lot of things. I have, I've seen it all. So I was just surprised that a woman who claimed to be innocent, an innocent housewife, for that matter, knew how to bribe an officer of the law. It was very uh, surprising. I was set up, obviously. Everything was done to make me feel like I was guilty of something, and I wasn't. He lied to the press and public. He requested for the bribe, and I gave in. I was out of my debt, and they needed someone to pin it on. They told me everything was over. I was relieved. I could be a mother again, run the businesses my husband left for me, and try to clear my name. They made me believe that it was all just a propaganda against me. At the EFCC headquarters, the three officers, Lamode, Omar, and Ribadu, were solidifying the case against Amaka and Najemba. The first two officers had reported the bribe, and Ribadu knew it was only a matter of time before she would reach out to him herself. When my officers came to me with uh, the money she bribed them with, uh, very surprised. You see, I was expecting that from Mude, not uh, Anna Jamba. Well, even though we, we made it look like she uh, didn't have any more trouble, but we, we increased the charges against her. <laughs> I was home when I got a call to come for another meeting. We, that is uh, Mude and I, had been going to their office. They said they were still investigating. So we had to show up. As she came in to answer routine questions, she was arrested. She demanded to know why and stated that she didn't do anything wrong. Then they played the video from the day she came to the office to bribe the EFCC chairman. I was shocked to my bone. They recorded only my side of the conversation, not theirs. They asked me for the monies, and I obliged. How was I to know they were setting me up? Hey, Christian. Christian will not rest in peace for what he has put me through. She gave her statement to the EFCC at a press conference. I am Mrs. Amaka Martins, an agent a citizen of Nigeria. I did my primary and secondary school. I got diploma in catering and hotel management. I am a widow of late chief, Ike Chuku Anejemba, who was murdered on the 4th October, 1998, blessed with four children. I have my business office at number four, Ogui Road, Enugu that by virtue of the death of my husband, I am a beneficiary and administrator of the estate of Chief Anejemba. I was completely kept as a housewife, a fact which is well reflected in my first Nigerian international passport issued on the 16th July, 1993. Hence, I had no involvement in the running of the business, investment, or the oppression of the bank accounts of my late husband. 
until his death. All the information and facts I stated hereby largely came to me after his death in October 1998. But I had pleaded not guilty to all the charges as I have never, never, all through my life, participated in any fraud or cr crime. I pray that the good office of the chairman shall thoroughly investigate this matter to ascertain that I am just being blackmailed and that I have no involvement whatsoever in the alleged crime. Hmm. My integrity as a person has never been in doubt. I have been honored by the Anglican Church as a mother of honor and also the Rotary Society as a result of my character. One of the witnesses that the prosecution brought was a Mrs. Rosemary Iloa Yonsi, who bought properties for the Anajembas and Ngude in the US. Did you conduct any business for the Anajembas? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I did. In, in addition to buying properties for Moody, I also purchased some properties for Christian Anajemba. The substantial funds were used to purchase the properties uh, that were transferred by Christian either to my account at Wells Fargo or to an escrow company. On 11th of September 1997, I remember I personally transferred the property at 1913 Spy Lane to Anajemba by way of gift. And on the 6th of April 1998, the property at 2756 Gramercy Avenue was also transferred by her to Anajemba. So after Anajemba died, the properties were sold and the proceeds were remitted to a trust in favor of Mrs. Amaka Anajemba. The trust was even known as Amaka Najemba Qualified Domestic Trust. How well do you know the second defendant, Amaka Najemba? I would definitely say I know Amaka Najemba quite well. Amaka Najemba, the widow of Christian Najemba. Yeah, I know her very well. We call her uh, Rosie Ford. Order. Order. When Amaka visited me in my house in California after Christian's death, she was accompanied by Mundi. This testimony alluded that she was in on it from the beginning. Rosemary revealed that she had a close relationship with Emmanuel Mundi, and she also knew Nelson Sakaguchi. Sakaguchi had referred to meeting a woman in London who introduced herself as Rosie Ford. Another witness was Daniel A. Zugo. He explained how he received huge sums of money to build and buy properties for the Anajembas. Please, can you tell us how you met Mr. Anajemba? I met the late Mr. Anajemba in December 1995. He bought property belonging to one of my clients, Mr. Ibeto and I acted as a middleman. Explain that to the court, please. What was the amount paid for the properties? 120 to 122 million. Was that the end of your dealings with Chief Anajemba? No, it was not. Subsequently, at the beginning of 1996, the papers for other land sales transactions were prepared and we arranged a meeting for it to be executed at Ibeto's house, Nnewi. He was admiring Ibeto's house and asked him, Who built it? Was it Jikapa? I said, It was me. Then he said, You are going to build my new house for me. Eventually, 
it led to my construction company, Omega Engineering Services, building a personal house for him in Enugu. For how much? 191 million naira. Nature of building? Onward Estate, a state of the art mansion. Did you finish it and when did you finish it? We eventually finished it, but it was after the death of an agenda. We finished in 2000. Who paid for the construction? Late an agenda. On signing of the contract, he paid 184 million naira, more than 90% of the contract sum. Who paid for the balance? His company, Dax Holdings. The contract was in the name of Dax Holding Nigeria Limited. And who represented Dax Holdings? At the end of the project, Dax was represented by Mrs. Anajemba. Did you hand over the property to anybody? Yes. Property was handed over to Mrs. Anajemba, representing Dax Holdings. Hmm. There was a lot of drama in this court case. The prosecution with their own, Emmanuel Mude with his own. I just wanted everything to be over and done with. I was in prison. Everything had stopped for me. I was tired. Not just for me, but my children. If my husband was truly involved in fraud and they had all this evidence against him, what could I do? So I thought maybe a little restitution would make everyone happy. William Ritchie had put in place his team to help recover the money for the two families in Nigeria. One of them was Babajide Ogundikbe from Sofunde, Osakwe, Ogundikbe and Belgor Law Offices. We brought Nelson Sakaguchi from Brazil. Um, our client's interest wasn't the prosecution of these people. The Nigerian government was interested in having them prosecuted and, and uh, convicted. But the concern of the clients was to get their money back. So after both Anijemba and um, Mude were arrested, we engaged in negotiations with them through their counsel. And um, we reached uh, an agreement with Ms. Dana Jemba at an early stage. And she agreed to pay, I think it was $50 million to the clients. And um, we told the EFCC this, and the EFCC then agreed to reduce the charges against her. And they reduced the charges against her she pled guilty to the reduced charges and was convicted and sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Order! Order! I therefore sentence the accused persons as follows. One, the second accused Amaka Martina Anajemba is hereby sentenced to two and a half years imprisonment on count 89. The third sentence shall be deemed to have commenced from 30 January 2004 when she was first remanded in prison custody. Two, on count 88, the fourth accused person shall forfeit the sum of five million U.S. dollars to the federal government of Nigeria. Three, on count 90, the fourth accused person shall pay a fine of one million naira. Four, and on count 91, the fourth accused shall pay a fine of one million naira and in addition thereto 
the properties listed in the Schedule A and B in the fifth edition approved of evidence dated 12th July 2005. Being proceeds of fraud shall be forfeited to the victims of the said fraud named in the charge as restitution. She might have been a housewife. But what we do know is that when her husband was killed, she took over the business. And I mean, he, he was running a tobacco business in, with, with some people in Kentucky. And that's where we were able to find some money. She had money in Switzerland, in a remote, in a remote, I mean, I'm talking about remote village, small town, $12 million in a bank account in a small town. You have to ask the question, you know, I mean, it's in her name, it's not in her husband's name. Um, so she's just a housewife. It's interesting to find out how she got, you know, she was able to salt $12 million away in a, in a remote Swiss bank. Um, she may have been, I don't know. All I know is that, you know, she had use of the proceeds of criminal conduct and um, we made the case against her that she wasn't entitled to retain those proceeds and that the people who were entitled to have those proceeds were our clients, the former shareholders of the bank, former majority shareholders of Bank of Estate. $12,316,228 was gotten from the sale of five properties in London and her personal and company bank accounts. $2,711,590 from her tobacco company and personal accounts in the USA. $10,621,494 from her foundation and personal accounts in Switzerland. To raise the remaining $25 million, she sold 20 properties in Ikoi and Ikeja, Lagos, Asokoro, Abuja, Potako, Giari, and Enugu State. Amaka Anajemba paid $50 million and was sentenced to two years in prison. But as she had served out most of her time while awaiting trial, she was released. While Amaka's case was being concluded, Imadol Umudes was still going strong. For him, he was ready to fight it out until the end. But what he didn't bargain for was that his life would be in danger. Attention, attention please. There's a bomb threat in this courtroom and we have to conduct a sweep. Please, please, leave the courtroom in an orderly manner. For joining us this week on 23419. If you enjoyed it, kindly share, review, and subscribe across all podcast platforms so you can get a notification once the next episode is released. You can ask us questions or leave feedback with voice messages on Anchor. This podcast was created, researched, and narrated by Choma Onyewe. Podcast cover designed by Ned Orji, written by Esther Kokori, sound designed by Hova Digital Sound, and produced by Ruth Dulak, brought to you by Rockinchur Productions. You can share your true life stories with us on Advanced Fee Fraud on 23419podcast at gmail.com. Till next time. Bye.